Okay, so hi everyone, and uh, welcome to this um, uh, int uh, overview video for Project 5 of uh, ECE 3311, Principles of Communication Systems. So in um, Project 5, um, as I mentioned before, it actually is the amalgamation of two projects. Um, the first project being quite a few single carrier modulation schemes and, um, and understanding how you take the analog waveform and visualize them in a vector format, in this case, a signal constellation, and then observing the impacts of things like noise. And then the second project was very much on like multi-carrier and OFDM and all that like good, you know, multiple data stream across different frequency subcarrier business, okay? So what was done here in project five is I took the, the relevant stuff from four and the relevant stuff from five that are all thematically related to the idea of taking the analog environment with noise and other forms of distortion and vectorize everything. So as a result, what you have in this project really is how do you see the world from the perspective of a signal constellation, right? So in this project, you will really get your hands dirty in terms of the single carrier and the multi-carrier modulation and the ability to visualize everything and characterize and understand what the heck is going on. We're not gonna be using any phase lock loops in this, this project. We, we kind of really idealized a lot of stuff. So there's just not enough time to also do PLLs, um, which is a bummer, but don't you worry. Like if you continue in the communications world, um, a path in, in communications, uh, you know, engineering and designing systems that transmit data and receive data, you will see quite a bit of phase lock loops, so don't you worry. Um, so what I really want to focus on are, in this project, the one-dimensional modulation schemes. That's ASK, right? It's either one or another value. Um, or, no, let me take it back. You can have multiple symbol representations of binary patterns, but they're all basically along, when you vectorize everything, one dimension. All you need is one dimension to represent all the different symbol, symbol, uh, symbol values uh, that are produced by a modulation scheme. Uh, we'll look at 2D modulation schemes, and that's going to produce beautiful representations in the in-phase and quadrature plane. That's exactly how we look at and visualize everything in the vector domain. What we look at is the IQ representations. I'll talk about that a little bit uh, in a few seconds. Okay. Then multi-carrier. So the first two, the 1D and 2D, that's great. But what happens if you run a whole bunch, like a series, a parallel number of either one-dimensional, two-dimensional modulation schemes simultaneously? How do you pull that off? Well, that's the third learning outcome. You'll learn how to do that, right? Uh, and then finally, there's something called error vector magnitude. We'll talk more about it in a more generalized format with respect to uh, like things like Euclidean distance and such um, in ECE 4305. But for now, uh, we'll just talk, talk about like how do we use a signal, signal constellation in order to say this received symbol actually is closer to that than that, like uh, what the heck is that, right? So we receive a, a symbol, it gets represented in the signal constellation diagram. And it's like, okay, what am I? Am I this symbol, which has a very, very well-known uh, point in the signal constellation, or that point? And this all relates to EVM, okay? So we'll talk about that. As usual, there's a Jupyter notebook that accompanies this project. So uh, definitely, definitely use it. So this will give you a good, good sort of starting point for building the rest of this project, all right? So in terms of the signal constellation diagram, let me, let me draw, let me, let me show you where we're coming from with all this. I kind of talked about this in class, uh, but I really want to uh, sort of dig into this a little bit more. What exactly are we doing here? Right. So, so what we want to do, so we already know, look, uh, this is this, we haven't seen this before. No, no, we've seen this a ton in this class, right? Okay. 
So there's a few things here. What I would love to know, right, is essentially this is unique data. You might say, well, what would this professor, like, you know, the modulation? And specifically to FC. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. FC carrier, right? But, but the thing is, this does not change symbol to symbol. Okay? So, so to me, in that regard, um, e to the j 2 pi f c of t um, doesn't really possess the, 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 the sort of insight on how to demodulate one symbol from another symbol from another symbol, number symbol. That's all contained within g of m of t. So I need some sort of way of representing it. Well, um, now the problem is uh, I need to vectorize this thing, right? So what we do is we actually go back a long ways back into the course, right? We talk about, right, we talk about basis functions. Um, uh, functions. I was about to do my shorthand. So, so basis functions, okay. So that's great. So basis functions, what we do is we can reduce this To, to a vector representation, okay? And we talked about, in particular, we talked about um, the cosine, cosine and, and sine, cosine and sine basis functions. And you would be absolutely correct because what do, do the basis functions need to be? They need to be orthogonal. Right. Um, what that means is the two are ninety degrees. Um, that the the two do not correlate with each other if we if we take the dot product of them. Well, and you might say, what the heck does that mean? So, like for instance, um, if I like you know if I take these two, and and I try, uh, like and I and and I try and correlate the two against each other. So I take these two, I multiply them by each other, and integrate one period. They should come out to zero, but there's actually something more important than orthogonal. This, like, basis functions are cool, but remember, like, from uh, from pre-calculus, we probably all seen this, right? Right. So we saw this, right? So we have x axis, y axis, z axis, and then we say, okay, why don't we represent everything in x, y, z? Oh yeah, but there was. But the thing is, is that we want something. Um, not only do we want to represent something in terms of uh, i, j, and k. I mean uh, x, y, and z. So three dimensional. So this is three dimensional space. But we want it also to be represented like these little fellas here. They're not only orthogonal with each other, right? Ninety degree, ninety degree, ninety degree angles, but they're orthonormal. So what we need is something also orthonormal, and orthonormal, okay? So what does that mean? So what happens if we do this with this is one, this with this is zero, this with this, zero. And we keep on doing, like with itself, it's unity. With others, it's zero. So that's orthonormal. And that's what would establish, very importantly, the orthonormal basis functions, right? Now, this, this is all ECE 4305 stuff. So there's like, there's like several lectures exclusively just on this. So we're not gonna go too much into it, but it's safe to say that we wanna take S of T and we saw this and we have what? We have X of T cosine two pi FC of T minus y of t sine two pi f c of t. Okay, so we look at this and we say, okay, um, how do we, all we want to extract, 
right? We saw this where g of m of t, okay, this is the information we do want. Remember, this and this is for all, for all symbols. So it's always there. So we want to extract it. Plus, it's kind of difficult to do any sort of analysis when you have information that's being modulated to FC. It's very difficult to visualize or vectorize, right? Uh, signal constellation diagrams, so again, are, are in the time domain. They're not in the frequency domain. So this is another useful tool. We don't have to go into the frequency domain. We're still in the time domain, but we take out a factor that makes it difficult to interpret any of it. So in this case, what we've got is this. All right? So now, if we can do that, and we know, and this is our IQ, in-phase quadrature representation, we saw this way earlier. Let's plot this stuff. What is the value, right? So we make a 2D constellation diagram, I and Q, right? So what we could do, is for a specific time instant, that's the origin, we have a value, let's say, at a specific time instant, nj, uh, sorry, n, ny of t of i. I'm, okay, so the, I'm just kind of, this is kind of sloppy. I wouldn't necessarily do that, but what would happen is, what I would do is, let, let me, is, like I would have like some sort of mapping where an in-phase and quadrature value that represents symbol, let's say we have a symbol here. Um, and what we would do is we would map it in I and Q because again, we know it's being modulated to FC, but what we wanna see is something like, let's say that symbol's there, we have a symbol there, so let's say that symbol I, that symbol J, that symbol K, that symbol M. So what we do is we plot this all over the place. This gives us a nice visualization of where all the symbols should be. And what also happens is when we have M is equal to 2B, this M means that we should have M signal constellation points in our IQ plane. So this means M points in IQ plane. And and, and what this, and so very importantly, the, the graphical location of each one of these, one, two, three, four, and elsewhere all over the place, right? Very, very important. So this gives us information about, um, you know, in terms of the amount of signal that's being used in both the in-phase, the, the in-phase representation and the, uh, and the quadrature representation for representing one symbol at a specific time and set. All right, and, 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 and I'm kind of hesitant about using T, and there's a reason for that, because, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna scrap T. I'm sorry, folks. I don't, I don't, I'm feeling kind of uncomfortable about using T like that, because, this, uh, because uh, X and Y of T, those, those are time domain functions, not one time instant. The symbol itself is a scalar, right? So in this year, there's gonna be an x value, i, yes, that's right. And there's gonna be a y value, uh, Silly me, I'm not thinking today. You know what, I need my coffee right next to me, right here. So let me that, okay, doop, boop, perfect, perfect. And this, so what happens is we need a way, and again, this is 4305 stuff, the conversion, the literal conversion between, let's say the x of t, and the y of t to an xi and a yi representing the symbol si. And note again that we know implicitly that this is operating at a carrier frequency fc. Uh, yes, okay, well deserved. So I know I've been rambling and I do that. So why am I talking about this so, so much? Because it happens here. It to whip. Okay. This is very important. Right? We have that. We have the complex baseband. 
So what we're effectively doing is we're converting everything down to operating complex baseband. So much easier to work with, so much easier to analyze what's happening with your waveform, waveform before as well as after it passes through the channel, right? And what I do, okay, is not only that, is um, what happens is we do, do this representation. So what, what you'll see, okay, in, in the project, and let me bring it up here in the, the Jupyter Notebook. So what I do in the Jupyter Notebook is, so if I set everything like this up, I work in complex baseband, and uh, what happens is I get this, this representation. Um, in addition to everything else, what I'll do is, uh, I have this, com uh, this, this, this representation, I then apply, let's say, some sort of pulse shaping filter to it, in this case, like uh, some Arcos, and then I transmit this over the air. Um, so you'll, you'll see that. In fact, let's, let's go there now. So I'm just going to do stop sharing. And, uh, where the heck is it? Uh, there we go. Can't detect, but that's fine. Share screen. So this is what, like, so what happens is in your Jupyter notebook. Okay. So first things first. I declare a whole bunch of stuff, okay? Just, t just leave that stuff alone, okay? <laughs> Same thing also for the plotting routines. This actually is really good practice. Um, I've seen too many times what people do with respect to, to producing plots is they use, either use the default, which is ginormously horrible because uh, the plots are gonna be every dimension, it's gonna be non-uniform, it looks very unprofessional, and the reality is, like, as engineers, you should be able to present things in a nice, nice, nicely formatted structure that people can easily access. Um, and and uh, you should be in 100% control of how you want to present it. So the, these commands here, and we've been using it for all the other projects in this course, um, are selected in such a way that you get a very, um, again, very professional, very much accessible set of plots that uniformly have the same appearance, okay? And then again, interpolate 1D, always a great function, um, and it, it mirrors that of the MATLAB equivalent, okay? So the preparations, we're gonna be transmitting 10,000 bits, okay? Carrier frequency, blah, I just chose two. It doesn't matter, it totally doesn't matter here. Um, sampling frequency, again, this is actually going to be important because when we use the raised cosine pulse, uh, we, have to, we have to have an app upsampled version first. That's why we have the interpolation function above that's defined. Um, and then we have the digital sampling rate, uh, the roll-off factor. Uh, again, none of these really, I don't want to say none of these matter. These matter, but that's the beauty about working in I and Q in the complex baseband, right? We saw this in project four. We don't need um, to really worry about the passband because when you work in complex baseband, when you work in I and Q, all you need to worry about is get the information from passband to the correctly sampled complex baseband symbols, and then we're off to the races. Then we can do the analysis of the received information in terms of understanding how the noise, how the channel affected it, all right? I'll exp so, so let's check it out. I think this probably explains a lot better than the blah, 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 blah tech stuff that I just uh, went through. So first things first, create the binary data. All right, then what I do is I take the binary data and I manipulate it. So the same 10,000 bits, I make two ASK. What does that mean? One bit equals one symbol. Okay, awesome sauce. In for ASK, two bits represent one symbol. So I have to reshape it. What does that mean? So I take a vector of like 10,000 and of height one, and now I make a vector of width 5,000 of height two. 
So every column, right, is two bits which represents, it's, it's two bits that represent one symbol. And that's actually quite elegant. We want to do that because then what we can do is we feed that into a function and column by column by column, it's very easy for the function to say, take this column, make it this symbol. And there's going to be a mapping function over here, right? So here, a to ASK, if it's a binary zero, make it minus one amplitude. And if it's a binary one, make it one. And for four ASK, we have minus three, minus one, one, and three, uh, given this mapping representation here. And that's why we put things into column format, because then it's very easy to index and be able to see, oh, we have this value and we have that value, make it minus three, and so on and so forth. Then we apply the raised cosine pulse, right? So in reality, in reality, before we, like, what we want to do is we want a pulse shape. That's a realistic system. Later on with the OFDM system, I'm a little bit lazy. I don't go through this step. So this step, again, is after we generate G of M of T. So it, it will factor in a little bit with respect to the IQ representation, but, and for completeness, we include it here. Uh, but again, like, you know, the channel is, is actually just a noisy channel. So the race cosine filter doesn't really do anything. And then secondly, um, not only, uh, like, you know, so, so we don't have to worry about z uh, zero ISI uh, or any of that business. But I want to put it there because let's say in the future, you do have a system that needs a race cosine pulse. You know what to do, right? We also have, and this was intentional, I made the assumption that you have perfect synchronization at transmit and receiver. So what ends up happening is you don't have to worry about being able to sample the right instant. That was intentional. In the old Project 5, you didn't have that. So you had to use a PLL and that got messy. I don't want you to focus on that. I want you to focus on IQ representations. So we create a raised cosine pulse. We zero pad, we have to, right? So we had to upsample because the raised cosine pulse is an up is an upsampled filter of 10, right? So how does that work again? Um, I, well, I'm, I'm just going to digress a little bit because that's what I do. This is what I mean. So remember, so if we have samples, so let's say that's my two ASK. And we have this, boop, 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 boop. What we need to do is we need to upsample, in this case, by putting nine zeros. And then what, what happens is we apply a raised cosine, we filter all of this, we convolve with an arcos. And how's that uh, set up? in the time domain. So what happens is we have something that has a non-zero value at zero. And then at the 10th sample, the minus 10th sample, it's, you know, we have something, but it's a zero crossing here and here. I'm sorry, I wish I could draw this better. Yep. And then we have another, if we have other zero crossings, depending on the length, so let's say that's 20, minus 20, another zero crossing here and here, such that at the end of the day, right, right? And then we have a raised cosine pulse there, correct? Yeah, and then another raised cosine pulse there. So what happens is just like with every other Nyquist zero ISI pulse shape, What do we have? So what happens is um, at the sampling, desired sampling instances, only we have a non-zero, hopefully unitary, unity gain, and then at every other non-desired sampling instance, it's zero. And for every, every symbol. So going back to this thing here, the code, 
That's why we have to upsample by 10. So what we need to do is, sure, we have that pulse shape where it's unity and then zero, zero, zero. But remember all the stuff in between. So we need to make sure that the race cosine pulse is aligned with where the symbols are in terms of the desired instant, which is non-zero, and the zero, and everything in between, the nine other samples in between, well, we throw those away anyway, right? But this is how we implement that race cosine pulse, okay? So we upsampled our data symbols, right? Like, so amplitude one is, is the uh, ASK, two ASK, and amplitude two, or amp two is our four PASK. So we upsample by a factor of 10, both of them, and then we convolve with the raised cosine pulse. So now we have a raised cosine pulse filtered for ASK and two ASK transmission. We now modulate to the carrier frequency, and again, doesn't matter, FC, mm -hmm. because we're gonna be throwing this away later on anyway. But before we do that, this is important. What we do is we add Gaussian noise. So here, uh, random standard normal. So standard normal, this is Gaussian. Gaussian has a few aliases, one of which is normal. So, so we add Gaussian noise to, uh, so we create uh, this guy, and then we add it to uh, TXASK waveform. But before we do that, we also have to modulate. So that's the thing. So we create the noise signal, but we have to modulate it. It has to be passband noise. So it has to be at the same frequency, right? S silly as it sounds, as the signal. It has to be within its band. And that's what we have here. We have two ASK, the transmission, four ASK, the transmission. We create the receive ASK two and four by adding noise here and here, all right? And the way we do that is we modulate it up. We do the exact same thing. There's an I representation. So here's the noise temperature. We modulate it to I and we modulate it to Q. And discussion about how to create passband noise, that's also in 4305. So there are quite a few 4305 concepts. Right now, it's like you should, accept it, right? Saying, okay, we trust Wiglinski. Like, he knows what he's talking about. Mm. Mistake number one? No, just kidding. No. But, but in 4305, I'm going to go through the mathematics of why this is happening, okay? So you add the noise, right? So that, that actually, again, is worth going over a bit. So, so what you do is you create the noise. Right, generate from, you know, some random number generator, random number generator. But then what you need to do, that's defined in baseband. So what you need to do is you need to create, um, so what you need to do is you need to modulate it Okay. So now you have passband. So I'm going to call it N of T PB because I'm not creative with names. So now that's passband. And now the signal model, very important. At silly me. The signal model at passband is R of T is equal to what? S of T plus N P B of T. I should read, you know what? The heck with that. I'm not gonna use that variable. I am going to use executive decision here, W of T, much better, yeah. So when we have to create the additive noise channels, that this is our pass band channel. And it's introducing the distortion, in this case, it's noise. So we add the noise to the passband signal to get the passband receive signal that gets intercepted 
intercepted at Rx. And we have to do the down conversion stage. Alrighty, folks. So let's go back here. Da, 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 da. So we go back here. So we down convert, right? So now we down convert. And what do we do? What we do is the same thing as before. We multiply. We, we, we take this into I and Q branches. And you might say, oh, oh, shucks. This is so much better done graphically. I need one computer to do all of this. <laughs> so what you do here is you take your R of T. Correct. <sighs> Moo. Multiply. So this is coherent detection. So again, super important. We know exactly everything. There's no phase offset. There's no frequency offset. Um, like in the previous lab five, right? I, I assume there was random phase, random frequency offsets. Uh, you don't know exactly where to sample. I, I made this, this project a little bit more difficult, but I removed those to put an OFDM because I felt like that's quite a bit, that's thematically more related and more important. And we will deal with those other elements in, in 4305, okay? So then what happens? We take this fella here, and this has I and Q represented and multiplied by cosine and sine. Uh, remember again, we'll have a DC term and we'll have a double frequency term. So there's gonna be a low pass filter here and here. And this will produce, fingers crossed, um, you know, your X of T term and your Y of T term. And then there's gonna be plus noise. Okay, and that's what we're going to play with. So that's exactly what's happening here, right? So we have cosine. We're going to basically we demodulate down to complex baseband, but it's not quite perfect yet because we still have the DC term and double frequency term. Same thing here. That's two ASK. That's four ASK. Sorry. 2ASK, cosine, cosine, sine, sine. And then what we do is we create using Furwin, right? This is from the SciPy, uh, SciPy uh, library. Uh, this is a low pass filter, right? Then we base it off of a Hamming uh, window and we low pass filter to only extract out the DC term. So now what we have is purely complex, ba uh, complex baseband I and Q for both two and four ASK. This last part again, super idealized, this thing. Um, what we do here is again, uh, all we have to account for is something called group delay. So because we're filtering and it's an FIR filter, this is going to create, because of the convolution process, uh, this will create a little bit of messiness in terms of the desired sample no, is no longer at zero or um, no, because we haven't downsampled this yet, right? It's not at zero, and it's not 10 values after zero, and it's not 20 values after zero, and so on and so forth. Uh, everything gets shifted, and it gets shifted by, um, by, uh, by some relationship to the length of the filter that you're filtering with. In this case, it's the Hamming window. So we, this here accounts for it, and it also successfully downsamples to the desired instances that represent the I and Q data per symbol without any sort of in-between material that we threw in through the interpolation process because of the raised cosine filter. Oh yeah, and that's the other thing. The raised cosine pulse also introduces group delay. So try it out. If you have, like, if you, multi if you convolve with a raised cosine filter and then a low pass filter, what you're effectively doing is the desired symbol pulse actually gets, um, the symbol value gets actually delayed by quite a few samples. It's no longer at zero. So you're going to have to find it and you're going to have to sample that. But then once you find that first sample, 
every other sample, again, is perfectly what you had when you did the interpolation. So in this case, we interpolate by 10. So once you find out how much of a delay is incurred by your raised cosine filter in your Hamming window, you then find it and then say, okay, next 10, next 10, next 10. But it's finding that first symbol that's really, really important. Okay, we took care of that for you here. But in real world, you're not gonna have that, that luxury. So you're gonna have to find that yourself, okay? And then you plot it. And here, what this plot represents, okay, this is two ASK and this is four ASK. What this plot represents, the red dot says, this is my IQ representation. So this is before I use uh, the modulation to uh, carry frequency FC, this is where my X of T and my Y of T, like if I were to map it to the uh, in-phase and quadrature plane, this is where it would be. And it makes sense, right? What were the amplitude values? One and minus one. And here it's one, three, minus one, minus three. The scatter plot is the effects of noise. So noise is added to I and noise is added to Q at every sample, right? So what does that mean? It means this. It means, so if I had an originally sample, so let's say this is I, this is Q. Remember, ASK is one dimensional. We don't have a quadrature component, but that's fine. So let's say we take four ASK. That's at plus one, that's at plus three, that's at minus one, that's at minus three. What happens is, when we add noise, remember the signal model at the pass band? And then we bring it down to base band. What's effectively happening is we add at every sample, we add some value that's determined by a Gaussian random variable. So at one sample, it's like, okay, here's a sample added to plus one, right? So the receive signal, the, your receiver says, oh, I didn't receive a plus one value, I received this thing, which has an I representation and a Q representation, right? Like remember, look at how this thing is represented. N of T cosine two pi FC of T minus N of T sine two pi f c of t. This fella, remember, what is this? Perfect, right? So what happens is you add this and this have cosine, that and that, uh, are part of sine. So what you end up getting very important. So the, uh, what effectively the noise does is it provides an offset from the ideal location and since it's noise, it's zero mean, it scatters it all around the ideal location in all of those cases. So if I send a, um, a symbol that has a representation of plus one, plus three, minus one, minus three, it's not gonna be exactly those values anymore. It's gonna be all over the place, but it's gonna be clustered around what the ideal is because it's zero mean. It will not deviate too far away from that. That's what we have in terms of a scatter plot here. Okay, so that's what we have here. So this is the preparation for the rest of this project. So if we go into two-dimensional, what I ask of all of you, so what, what happens is you might say, well, Wiglinski, um, isn't it one-dimensional? Why do you have stuff in the queue? Well, ASK is one dimensional, but not the noise. 
the passband noise occurs in I and Q. So that's why we have deviation in the Y axis and the Q axis, right? And this is kind of a nice setup because what will happen is you could use the exact same noise model, but now what you need to do is you now need to apply it to QPSK, right? So I think I ask of the class to do this in QAM. So that's very easy, right? So take QASK and take two of those points and move it by one along the, the, um, the, uh, the Q axis and take another two points and move it by minus one on the Q axis, right? So you get this beautiful uh, four point uh, square looking type of pattern, right? And what you should get very beautifully if you add noise to it is the same thing you have here, like this buckshot pattern, but it's gonna be boop, 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 boop. So you need to do that for square, four, QAM, and 45 degree rotated QPSK. So that's the first, the first of your, 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 um, your um, activities for this project, right? So if we look at it, let's look at it. So once you do this, so there's a lot of words here, but essentially what I want you to do is um, you have the scatter plots here for two ASK and four ASK. I want you to take the same code, right? That, that was generating these one dimensional signal constellation points. And I want you to do it for four, Q, uh, four QAM, QPSK, but 45 degree rotated and 16 QAM. And 16 QAM is a little bit more complicated, but not by much, okay? Then following that, the, uh, the ortho, so that was kind of quick. It was like, wow, that's single carrier. Yes, I want to get all of you ready for multi-carrier, okay? So multi-carrier, the way this works, okay, is the following. The way multi-carrier works is you, you right away generate, right? You right away generate N, I, I forgot it was N or M. Um, I'm going to say n n subcarriers, and each one has a binary pattern. I think it's either a binary pattern or already one symbol. I think it's binary data. So you, let's say you create b bits, b bits, b bits, b bits. So you, in parallel, you create b bits across n subcarriers. You individually modulate them into one symbol. Okay, so you have one symbol, one symbol, one symbol, one symbol. So let's say you, you make one QAM symbol here. Uh, let's say one 4AM QAM. Okay, so only one symbol. You take the IFFT. There's an IFFT block somewhere there. You've now created at the output one OFTM symbol. So, so what you do is you take that, you do a parallel to serial conversion. So now you got this. This, folks, is one OFTM symbol. And then the rest of the code is taking this, you add noise to it, now go from that back to parallel, take the FFT, okay? You should get the original subcarriers or close to it, right? Um, then at each subcarrier, you have to make a decision. What is it? What Q, for QAM symbol is it? Demodulate it back into binary, so here you get four QAM symbols. So what there, we use is something here called hard decoding. Hard. So essentially, who, who am I? Who do I most closely represent? Okay, we get 
for QAM, we then demodulate into binary info again. So every subcarrier should have B bits. And then what we do is we see, do these bits here match those bits there? That's what this code does, but it does it for one OFDM symbol. Okay, and you'll see, you'll see what, um, like, you know, like later on, you'll have a little bit more responsibility with that. So this is what happens. So first of all, ah, uh, yes, see, data subcarriers is 52. So you have 52 subcarriers. SNR, what SNR is, signal to noise ratio. This is in decibels, right, dB. What this tells me is how much noise do I throw in to my OFDM symbol? And the smaller the SNR, the worse the noise is, right? Signal to noise ratio. I want the noise power versus the, the sorry, I want the signal power over the noise power. I want the signal power to be bigger than the noise power, right? Signal power to noise power ratio, SNR. And what this guy is, total OFDM symbols. Well, I should have chosen a better variable name. Total number of bits. Remember I said there's B bits per subcarrier? This is the total number of bits that are communicated in one OFDM symbol. Okay. So I generate all these bits that, that allow me to generate one OFDM symbol. All right. And what's M? M is equal to 2B, the 2 to the power B. So M is, um, uh, shucks. So, so, um, so M is the number of symbols that are created from, uh, from all the bits that I generate here, okay? So what ends up happening is this process here, I reshape it again into columns. So uh, what I do is I take all the bits that are randomly generated here. I then put, rearrange them into, uh, uh, into 52 data carriers, subcarriers, and, and and uh, the, the number of rows per column, uh, eventually I'm gonna map them to one symbol, right? That will have B bits each. And that's what's happening here, right? I'm doing this mapping thing. Again, this is for, uh, shucks, I think it's for, yeah, QAM. And then from there, okay, I have now 52, QAM symbols, each on an individual subcarrier, and I apply the IFFT. I know, you see NP, NumPy, FFT, IFFT. That last one's the important one. This means that I'm doing the inverse fast Fourier transform. Do not, do not do FFT. It mathematically won't make sense. You gotta do IFFT at the transmitter, FFT at the receiver. And that is our OFDM symbol. Okay. Then what I do is I transmit that one OFDM symbol okay, across a noisy channel. So what I do is the same thing I did before, and I throw in noise. But notice I don't modulate this. That's the thing. Because look at what I did in single carrier. Like by representing thing, everything in I and Q, I don't really need to pulse shape. I don't really need to go into the passband. I'm doing everything here in the complex baseband. I'm doing everything in I and Q because the way I set it up, all I need is I and Q, right? The, that's where all the information is contained. Otherwise, I'm just gonna be like, oh, okay, run through the, uh, through the pulse shaping filter. Okay, modulate to FC. Okay, throw the passband noise. Okay, now let's demodulate it back down to complex baseband and then sample specific instances. Da, 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 now I have my information. Why? So this, this saves us a few steps and this is totally legitimate. So I add complex baseband noise here, right? There's no cosine, there's no sine. I add it to my OFDM sim, uh, signal, right? To my o OFDM. Uh, transmission, okay? And then I'm done. What happens is now I have my OFDM received signal. 
and then I apply the F of T, okay? Very important, it's this second one. That's F of T, that's I of T. Don't, don't, uh, the first one, I don't even know, like that's nomenclature-wise, they could have done a little bit better there. So now I've added to every subcarrier a tiny little bit of noise defined by this. And also, very important, Yeah, so see SNR there? <sighs> the SNR shows up there, right? So this is important. So this is where we use that SNR value in order to define the signal to noise ratio. So how much stronger is my signal versus the noise in this transmission? So then I convert every subcarrier of that OFTM symbol back to a QAM symbol, decode the QAM, into bits and I'm done. But before I do that, I wanna map every one of those QAM symbols per subcarrier. I wanna see how much the noise has disturbed every subcarrier. So I do a scatter plot, and this you also see in the handout. So every one of these uh, points is a QAM symbol that got distorted by the channel on, uh, during the OFDM transmission. It's not a series of QAM symbols that got transmitted on one subcarrier, remember, uh, the way this works is it's one, it's, um, I'm sending, uh, in this case, 52 QAM symbols simultaneously across a noisy channel by uh, modulating it using an IFFT, right? And we get this. So your task, okay, for, for, this, for this part of the project, there are several, okay? So I, I outline again, one, two, three, four, five. That's what we just went through, and one, two, three, four, five. So these steps have already been implemented for you in the Jupyter Notebook here. So what I'm asking is now do everything here, but now for QPSK, offset, uh, uh, the pi over four offset QPSK, right? Uh, then the next question is, I want you to make this an OFDM transmitter receiver that you can send a thousand, ten thousand, a million OFDM symbols. So now you've got to figure out how do you communicate a stream of OFDM symbols, all right, across uh, using the exact same code. But of course, you're going to have to modify it. So that's, that's question five. So a lot of fun. All right, last but not least is EVM. So error vector magnitude modulation detection. So here, what we wanna do is we want some way, like in a nutshell, I'm gonna to go to the plot that, that really means a lot. So what happens is we got this scatter plot. Let's say you get this scatter plot here. Each one of these is a QAM symbol. None of these look like the QAM symbol that was transmitted, right? So suppose I transmit this, but I got that. How the heck do I make a decision on what each one of these are? What happens is you use EVM. What you do is you, you effectively say, what's the distance, okay, in the IQ? So now that we have a 2D plot, this is very easy, right? You could do, like, what's the difference? Like, you know, you could calculate. We have, uh, an x-axis and a y-axis. What's the distance of this point to that possible QAM symbol representation? That point, that point, that point. Choose the shortest distance, and that's what it gets mapped to. So this plot here is actually pretty important because this allows us to map every one of these, okay, every one of these red dots that does have a known binary pattern associated with it. And that's what this code does, right? So you have the signal constellation. So this vector here gives you, calculates the distance between received QAM and actual QAM values. Okay? So, so that's what, so that's what this last guy is here. Right? So you got to do this, okay? And root mean squared, okay, 
is is the is the is is uh, the way of calculating that, right? So, so you do it for four ESK, you do it for QAM offset QPSK, and what what I want you all to do. This is actually kind of useful because what this does is it allows for a mapping, but also more importantly, um, if you look at the general error. So in this case. Uh, look look at the distance between all of these. Like let's say you sum all of these distances, you take the square. So this is the error, right? Between that's received, the blue dot, and what it should be, the red dot. So if we take the root mean squared, right? So we take all these folks, square them and 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 sum them up together. Well, what's the root mean square of all these errors? And here we know, here we know this is this is um, this is QAM, but what happens if we didn't know this was QAM? Suppose this could have been QAM, this could have been uh, pi QPS, a uh, pi over four QPSK, or, or this four ASK. Um, how do we know which modulation scheme this is in the first place? Well, what happens in that case is you use the mod the modulation detection that I'm talking about here. Is let's suppose you use all four modulation schemes. And what you look for is not necessarily um, mapping per se, but what you want to do is, is the following. And you might say, what the heck is Wiglinski talking about? So this is what I'm talking about. So suppose you have this scatter plot. And this could be either this, it could be this, or it could be this. And that's what the question's asking. So the thing is, what I want all of you to do is, which one of these modulation schemes yields the, the smallest amount of error. And by that I mean, if you were to try and decode this with this, it's gonna give you an RMS okay, of a certain amount. So that's basically that mapping thing I was telling you about. If you use now QPSK, yeah, theoretically all these points should not map very well. It should be a lot farther away. It should yield a larger RMS. And then with 4ASK, you better believe it. It's going to become, if you transmitted 4QAM, but you're trying to decode with 4ASK, it's going to be it's going to be very noticeable the 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 error, right? So what I want all of you to do is really compare side by side, like sorry, not side by side, but I want you to transmit with one modulation scheme. But I want you to use the to try and receive and do root mean squared error vector magnitude uh, calculations to, to show that the error is smallest with, let's say if you transmit four qualm, you should get the smallest uh, error, our RMS EVM with four qualm, and the other two should be much larger. And then, you know, do the same thing. You transmit four ASK and test the uh, root mean squared EVM with the other three. And then same thing with the QPSK. So mix and match. And then what I want you to do is with OFDM, I want you to do uh, the same thing with like, you know, decoding using EVM. And then explore, I want you to play around with signal to noise ratio. What I want you to do is I want you specifically to find out what the signal to noise ratio should be for an OFDM. So you can't, in reality, you can't control the signal noise. Well, you could if you increase the transmit power. So find the signal noise ratio of an OFDM transceiver. That means transmitter through channel to receiver. I want you to find the SNR that would yield a bit error rate. So that's the number of bits at the receiver okay, that differ compared to what was transmitted. Um, and that is a ratio of those bit errors versus all bits transmitted in the communications. And so the way you calculate that, okay, is it's a ratio. So what does this mean? One out of every hundred bits is an error. 
One out of every 1,000 bits is an error. One over every 10,000 bits <clears throat> is an error. I want you to find out what's, what SNR values yield that, that, and that. Right now, I'll give you SNR equals eight. What really is the SNR value to yield those bit error rates? And then also, what are the corresponding EVMs for that? All right. And there's a trick. You don't want to transmit okay, um, data, bits, until you get one bit error. Now that, that statistically is not reliable. There's a rule of thumb that can, you can derive. You need 100 errors to be 95% confident about uh, the error rate. So what you would need to do is you would need to run your OFDM transmitter until your receiver has accrued a 0 0.01 bit error rate. Um, and, uh, and that means you have to have 100 errors in order to get, and so, so that's approximately 100,000 bits you need to transmit and then a million bits, and then 10 million bits in order to, get, in order to have 95% confidence of 100 errors, okay? All right, and then report submission. Same as before, Jupyter Notebook submission via the 3311 Canvas website. All right, um, so that, that really kind of summarizes this project. It's, it's, it's not difficult. There are a lot of hoops and hurdles that you need to go through, but, but yeah, I mean, um, definitely reach out to me, reach out to Kartik uh, if you have any questions about this. Uh, don't leave this to the last minute. Again, this is the final week uh, coming up for the term, so it's going to be very busy. Uh, so definitely um, reach out as soon as possible if you have any questions about this, uh, this project. All right, so that, that concludes the overview for Project 5 of ECE 3311.